thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Once again, it is great to have you with us today. I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with us. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Now, I'm going to jump right into the message without much, by the way, of introduction to this message, as there's a number of verses that we're going to cover today. Those take some time, and and we want to stay closer to that that 25-minute mark than the 55-minute mark, so we're going to get going here. We're We're going to keep the pace moving a little bit. We're going to go first to a story that, that many of us are familiar with. We've heard it before. And we're going to start there. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, it's told by Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And if you're following along in your Bible, it may not sound quite the same if you're in a different version. Uh, I'm using the New International Version just so that you can be aware. All right, so let's go there. Let's read Luke 10, 25 through 37. They say this. They say, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, and this is where the story of the Good Samaritan comes in, he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled came to the place where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think is a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers? The expert of the law replies, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. There's a good chance that that some of you have heard this story over and over again, many, many times. After all, it's one of the stories that people like to, to go to and be reminded of that when when we're told that we are to love others. So with that in mind, I want to approach today's message with a couple of questions in mind. I think there's actually about three questions I really want you to consider. They are these. They They are these. Is there anything new that I can take away from this? Is there anything new I can take away from this? Is there anything that I need to be reminded of from this part of the Bible? And is there anything that I could learn from this that that might somehow impact how I view my responsibility to care for the planet? Now let's pray, and let's see if we can answer those questions in today's message. Will you join me in prayer? God in heaven, I'm so thankful for who you are. I'm thankful that you love us and care about us wherever we are, whether we're here, whether we're gathering online, wherever it is that you know us. You know what's going on in our lives. You know what we need. You know where we're at. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to us in whatever our individual circumstances are, that we would hear from you today. God, direct my words that it would only be what you want me to say, and that that's what people would hear is what you are saying. In Jesus' name, amen. What is gluttony? I want to ask that question. What is gluttony? It's a word in the Bible, and it's often referred to as one of the, the seven deadly sins by some people. But what is it? Now, often we hear it relating to food and, and overindulging and eating and eating too much. And this is certainly one very valid definition, one valid explanation. And there's also another definition. It's habitual greed. That would be greed that is repeated over and over and over and over again. 
Now, a week ago, after I was done with the message, there was a group of people discussing how the rest of the world may see the wastefulness of the Western world and, and Western culture. Specifically, how do they see us here in America? How are we viewed by other people? How do they view Christians in light of the, the perceived wastefulness? Do they see us as, as not respecting the God who is the creator of the universe because we don't take care of what he created? And, and the consensus to these questions was that, that probably the answer is no. But we honestly didn't think, as we talked about it, that, that people actually look at Christians different because of it. Now, after this conversation had ended, after it was over, I was approached by someone who has done a decent amount of traveling around the world, and they commented that they believe, their opinion is, that what people see when they look at us here in America or as in, in prosperous nations is they see us as gluttons. Now, this wasn't tied necessarily to our relationship with God, but instead it was to our greed and, and our our get all we can get kind of attitude. And as I thought about it, I was realizing that this is exactly what we're going to be looking at today. This is what we're going to be talking about in today's message. Now, I don't think any of us want to think about ourselves as gluttons. We, we don't want to be thought of as people who are overindulging in what we eat or people who have, have dealt with habitual greed. It's just not who we want to be. It's why Scrooge in the story of the Christmas Carol is looked at as that evil person. He wants to get all he can get, and he really doesn't care who he steps on in the process of getting it. Now, gluttony is often tied to obesity, and people don't want to be thought of as obese. In fact, I read an article this last week about how people who are qualifying for the coronavirus vaccine, some of them are qualifying because they've been labeled as obese. And while they were happy to have the vaccine, while they were happy that they could actually get it, they were sad to know that they were considered obese. They felt it was like a slap in the face. No one wants to be thought of as obese. No one wants to be thought of as a glutton. And then since none of us want to be labeled as a glutton, the thought that others around the world may look at us as gluttons, as habitually greedy people, may not sit well with you. I hope it doesn't sit well with you. Now, it may not sit well with you because it's not true. Like, like some people are obese through no fault of their own, it is possible that you live in a wealthy nation, but you aren't greedy. You aren't a glutton. And, and this label hurts because it's just not your fault. It's not true. Even though because of the people around us, we appear gluttonous to others in the world. And, and as much as you and I may not like this label, we can't deny that many of us have a lot of what we don't need. Now, I'm not saying even that it's wrong to have those things. Please do not hear that. What I am saying is that to many people, it may seem that we are greedy and have things that are unnecessary. But I really don't think this is necessarily why people see us as gluttonous. My guess would be that if people see us as gluttonous, the, the reason could potentially be the way we see so much of what we have as disposable. After all, how many of us have disposed of something because it wasn't really in style anymore? The shoes just weren't quite as stylish as what other people were wearing. The, the shirts that we had weren't the right style anymore. The skinny jeans style is so, so yesterday, so 2020, and, and you had to get rid of them to get something new. That whatever item you had just is not the in thing anymore, so you get rid of it. Now, maybe another reason people see us as gluttonous is the number of vehicles we own or the size of our houses that we own or, or the overall amount of stuff that we own. Right now, storage units are a great business to be in because we have more than we can use in our homes at one time and more than we can keep in our homes. It has to go somewhere, so we put them in storage units. As a parent, have you ever thought back to the toys that you brought your kids I want my kids, and I always wanted my kids, to have nice toys and nice gifts at Christmas and birthdays and a variety of other times. I wonder how many things that we bought our kids that they played with a time or two, and then, then it went into a box somewhere. Now, hopefully it wasn't that many times that this happened, but I might have blocked it out because I don't want to think about the money that was wasted if that was the case. I do know, I do know that even I realized a number of years ago that our kids didn't need all of the gifts that they received at the holidays and that a number of the gifts needed to be reduced. And so we reduced those number of gifts and we replaced those items with, with maybe some more expensive things, but things that they would use for longer or items that they would need. 
Now, is the, is the crazy amount of, of buying gifts greed? I don't know. Are storage sheds always due to greed? I would say no. At the same time, I do know that our, our gift buying and our acquiring of stuff can be wasteful. And that is one of the dangers of greed and seeing how much we can get. Our greed leads to waste, and our waste is poor stewardship. Said more concisely, our greed leads to poor stewardship. Do you know the parable of the talents? We're not going to read it today, but it's found in Matthew 25. Jesus tells it. And there's a man who is going on a trip, and he leaves three of the people who work for him with some money. And while he's gone, two of these three people realize that they've been given the responsibility of handling this guy's money. And they want that he would want them to handle it like he would. And they look for ways to invest. They know that he has a reputation of making money where it looks like none can be made. And, and they know that they need to make the most of this opportunity. And by the time this person who gave them the money returns, the two have managed that money, and they've managed to double what they were given. The guy whose money it is is happy, he's thrilled, and he gives them even more responsibility. Now, the third guy who was trusted with, with this man's money decided he didn't want to lose it. He didn't want to make a mess of it, so he would just hold on to it. And when that man returns, obviously he's not happy, and he calls this guy worthless. The reality is, we are like these three men. God has trusted us with certain resources. Not all of us have the same amount of resources, but we are each expected to use the resources, the things God's given us, we're expected to use them wisely. And while none of these three men appear to have messed up by being greedy and using the money for themselves, it would have been a way they could have poorly used it when they were trusted with it. If they had gone and wasted it on things that they didn't need and didn't benefit the man whose money it was, he certainly would not have been happy. After all, he was expecting to use that money, that they would use that money that he trusted them with for his benefit. Did you know the average American had $5,135 in credit card debt this past year, in 2020? And according to the Federal Reserve, the average credit card charge, the average interest rate, is 14.65%. That means that the average American spent $752 in interest last year. Now, I realize that there are plenty of cases where credit card debt isn't due to greed, but I also realize that sometimes it's from buying things that we don't need. I realize it because I've done it myself, and I know that I'm not alone. Now, when this is the case, when, when we are using our credit cards to put us in debt, causing us to, to pay interest, which causes us to pay more for an item than it's worth, that is poor stewardship. We mentioned having more than we, we can fit in our house and forcing us to pay rent on a place to store stuff that we don't need and don't have room for in some cases. So I'm not going to spend more time on that. Just know that that too, in some cases, may be poor stewardship. How about this? Are you working insane hours in a job to get stuff that you don't need but just want to have? You just feel you have to have it? but you don't get to use what you get because you are working ridiculous amount of hours. And don't try telling me that this doesn't happen right now because of the pandemic and everybody staying at home. I've actually heard from a number of people around the world who have said that they have worked more without taking time for rest, without taking time off during the pandemic than they did before this. So let me ask this, are you working crazy hours to get stuff you don't need at the expense of time with people who are important to you or need you? Your time is a resource that God has trusted you with. You need to be sure you're using it well. How are we using what God has trusted us with financially? How are we using our time? Are we wasting these things? Now, now one more thing on stewardship and, and managing what God has given us well. It's simply to remind us of something that we have talked extensively about a couple weeks ago. And that's the that in addition to our time, in addition to our finances, we need to manage this planet well. We need to manage this, this place that we live well. When we are greedy, when we are wasteful, it can lead to other issues outside of our lives directly by bringing more garbage into, into landfills or, or bringing in pollution and causing pollution and, and so on. And I know we've covered it before, but I wanted to connect the dots again so you can be part of managing the planet well, of stewarding it well. Now let's go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. It's been a little while, and maybe you thought I'd forgotten about it, and maybe you're wondering, well, how does that fit into this talk about greed and about stewardship? 
Let me walk you through it right now. Let me go through it with you in this next few minutes. You see, there, there is an injured man who's been beaten and robbed, and he's been left for dead. He's laying by the road. And along comes this priest. And do you remember what he does? He walks to the other side of the road and then keeps going. And now next comes this Levite, who's another type of religious leader. And do you remember what he does? Yep. He does, too, does the same thing. He walks on the other side of the road. Now, why would they have done this? Clearly, there was a man there that needed their help. Why would they have walked on the other side? Honestly, we don't know. Maybe it was because they were business, busy men. After all, they were religious leaders. Maybe they had important people they needed to meet with. Or maybe they had places to go. After all, they were, were walking down the road, so they must have been going somewhere. Maybe, maybe they were on a schedule and they couldn't miss some important appointment. Or maybe they were concerned about being unclean. This guy had been beaten and left for dead. They, they were trying to help him. If they were trying to help him, and if he died, they would have been considered unclean. And who knows, maybe they would have been considered unclean anyway because of the blood and any other things that this man was lying in. For whatever reason, what they had going on seemed to be more important than them stopping to help an injured man. Now along comes a Samaritan, and immediately he starts giving of what God has given to him. It begins with his time. Not only did he stop, but he also took the time to bandage the wounds. And once he was done, he put the injured man up on his donkey and takes him somewhere to rest. And when the wounded man is settled in at the inn, the Samaritan man tells the innkeeper that he will go back, he will come back, and he will settle up with him. He was, he was giving more time and stopping back in to take care of the man. Now, now, in reality, I don't know if he was planning on being back by there anyway or, or what his future plans were or what he did for, for work. But regardless of whatever his plans were, he was committed to being back there, giving his time now. And the man didn't stop with just using his time to help the injured man. No, he also uses what he has. He takes some of his possessions. We're told he poured oil and wine on the man's injuries and that he bandaged him up. He used something that he had to bandage him up. But he didn't stop with giving his time and sharing his stuff. He, he also gives money to cover the man's expenses. He gives up two days' wages to cover the cost of the hotel. And he asks the innkeeper or tells the innkeeper that, hey, if you need more, let me know. I'll cover that cost as well. This man who had previously been left for dead was blessed by this Samaritan because this Samaritan man was willing to give of what he had to a man that he had never met but was in need. 